This lecture series on radiology of the temporal bone is dedicated to my mentor, Bill Rothfuss. When I was a fellow, Bill had me write a chapter on temporal bone imaging, and although we never published the chapter, it's become the basis of my lectures on the temporal bone for the last 20 years. Enjoy your retirement, Bill. How do you cover anything as massive as the temporal bone? Well, we're going to try and do it by breaking it down into anatomic regions, the external auditory canal, cerebellopontine angle, petrous apex, regular bulb, and facial nerve, and then run through some clinical scenarios like hearing loss, tinnitus, and dizziness, uh, trauma, and then a discussion of the implants that you might find in the temporal bone. I like working from the outside in, so let's begin our review of the temporal bone with the external auditory canal. Ask yourself, which modality would I use to image an abnormality of the external auditory canal? The big winner here is going to be computed tomography. Part of that is because we have gas on the inside and bone and cartilage forming the walls of the canal, and uh, CT does a good job with those types of materials. But the big reason here is bone erosion. The presence or absence of bone erosion defines our differential diagnosis in the external auditory canal. When you see a mass or abnormality in the external auditory canal, the first thing your eyes should go to is the presence or absence of bone erosion. When bone erosion is present, we should be thinking about things like invasive tumors, squamous cell carcinoma, obviously on anemic mucosal surface. Malignant otitis externa is a famous cause of bone erosion in the external auditory canal, sometimes called necrotizing otitis externa. And then cholesteatomas. We like to think of cholesteatomas as middle ear lesions, but they often involve the external auditory canal. When we have an aggressive mass in the external auditory canal, obviously we're going to be worried about malignancy. See how the posterior wall of the external auditory canal is intact, and the anterior wall has this large defect, and there is this calcifying mass that extends across that anterior wall. These are intrinsic tumor calcifications, not just leftover, not quite completely eroded bone. These, this is a tumor matrix, and this happens to be uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma of the temporal bone, although we know that squamous cell carcinoma is going to be the most common malignancy to affect the external auditory canal. These erosions here, the key finding. Here's another malignancy affecting the external auditory canal. Uh, this time the soft tissue completely fills the external auditory canal, but look at these little rat bites, both on the anterior and posterior walls of the external auditory canal. That, those are the erosions that we're looking for to suggest neoplasm. This one happens to be a basal cell carcinoma. Now, this one is not a tumor. It is malignant or necrotizing otitis externa. Notice again all the little rat bite defects in the anterior and posterior walls of the external auditory canal. This is a classic appearance for necrotizing otitis externa. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting uh, disease and merits its own lecture at a future date. Now I'm going to throw up the last two pictures that I showed you, necrotizing otitis externa and malignancy. I have to tell you, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one is which if I hadn't just shown you the two pictures myself, right? This one happens to be an infection. This one happens to be a malignancy. They look nearly identical and tissue sampling in the clinical scenario are going to be what differentiate these two lesions. Remember this differential diagnosis and how similar these look. Our next aggressive mass of the external auditory canal with bone erosion is a cholesteatoma. There should be a smooth line of cortex forming the posterior wall of the external auditory canal right along here. Instead, there is this gap in the external auditory canal, and this odd soft tissue mass is filling in the gap. What's odd about this mass is that it has linear areas of gas intercalating into the tumor. It's almost as though there were layers of tumor that could be separated from one another. That's in fact exactly what this is. 
These are keratin layers that are separating within the walls of a cholesteatoma. Now, just like an onion, onions have layers, ogres have layers, and cholesteatomas have layers. But what if there isn't any bone erosion in the external auditory canal? Then we're looking at more benign lesions, such as osteomas, and the collection of osteomas that we call surfer's ear. There's keratosis obturans. Sometimes, actually most commonly, we just get impacted cerumen, and that has a distinctive radiologic appearance. But there can also be cutaneous lesions, because remember, this is skin forming the walls of the external auditory canal, so cutaneous lesions can affect the EAC. This is a characteristic appearance of an ivory osteoma affecting the external auditory canal. You can see that it is a sessile mass, and most importantly, it is of exactly the same density as cortical bone, as we'd expect for an osteoma in any location. You can tell in this particular instance which wall the osteoma arose from. This is often very useful to the surgeon if they can't see past any part of the osteoma. It's nice to know where it is anchored. Here's another example of an osteoma affecting the external auditory canal, uh, this one arising from the floor of the canal, extending superiorly, again occluding the canal. You can see that some debris has accumulated uh, behind the osteoma because it's obstructing the external auditory canal. This one's not quite as dense as the ivory osteoma that we saw previously. There were probably fibrous components to this osteoma. As you know, osteomas have ivory and fibrous subtypes. When there are multiple osteomas encroaching uh, on the external auditory canal from all sides, that's usually from exposure to chronic exposure to cold water. That's why it ca it's called surfer's or swimmer's ear. You can see that there is a mound of osteoma arising from this side, a mound of osteoma arising from that side. They're practically going to meet in the middle and occlude that external auditory canal. Numerous osteomas is what we call swimmer's ear. Keratosis obturans is an unusual and odd diagnosis. Here we have keratinaceous debris that completely fills the external auditory canal. It's almost always the medial portion of the external auditory canal abutting the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane forms a border between the soft tissue of the keratosis and the gas that is normal in the middle ear cavity. So here's the tympanic membrane. Complete occlusion of the medial external auditory canal is the finding that we're looking for for keratosis obturans. Otherwise, it's a very benign appearance, right? No erosions of any of the walls, sort of a smooth margin to it, but it's a complete plug of the medial external auditory canal. Interestingly, this disease looks histopathologically just like a cholesteatoma, so uh, we can help out our colleagues in pathology by indicating that there are no erosions and it's probably just keratosis rather than a cholesteatoma. Impacted cerumen, by far the most common thing that we're going to encounter in the external auditory canal. The bubbly gas that forms within cerumen is the clue, and the fact that it's not adherent to any of the walls of the external auditory canal, usually, unless it gets packed down with a Q-tip. Here's an example of a cutaneous lesion that happened to arise in the skin of the external auditory canal. You can see that this large cystic structure is actually in the cartilaginous, more lateral portion of the external auditory canal. It's a uniform cyst, and uh, it turns out to be just a, a sebaceous cyst of that skin. Malignancy is the diagnosis that we associate with erosions. So is it possible to get a malignancy that does not erode bone? Well, there is a classic malignancy that tends to be polite with surrounding structures and doesn't have a very, very aggressive appearance. That's lymphoma. And so be a little bit wary because the one malignancy you want to consider when there are no erosions is lymphoma. 
And this is an example of lymphoma of the external auditory canal. Congenital abnormalities of the external auditory canal are on a spectrum of stenosis, and atresia is at the extreme end of that spectrum. When a patient is imaged for congenital stenosis or atresia of the external auditory canal, the surgeons don't want to know that there's stenosis of the external auditory canal. They already know that. What the surgeon is asking is, what are the associated anomalies of the inner ear and middle ear that will determine whether it's worth trying to reconstruct the ear? So there are a list of potential abnormalities of the middle ear and inner ear that we need to be looking for and reporting. In particular, we want to know whether the ossicles are intact or whether they're just an ill-formed mush of material where the ossicles ought to be. The stapes in particular, very important to seek out. We also want to look at the foot plate, that is the oval window, and make sure that it is open and not just a bony carapace where that oval window ought to be. We want to judge the size of the middle ear cavity. Small middle ear cavities are very difficult to reconstruct. Facial nerve displacement is absolutely critical. In patients who have congenital stenosis, the facial nerve is frequently displaced, say, to the lateral aspect of the middle ear cavity, where it is in great danger from the surgical approach. The worst case scenario in surgical repair of congenital stenosis is to accidentally cause a facial nerve paralysis, worst case scenario. All of these anomalies are gathered together into a scheme called the Jarsdorfer classification that predicts the likelihood of success of reconstructive surgery. So that's how it's being used by our surgeons. Another abnormal, congenital abnormality of the external auditory canal is upsloping EACs that is frequently associated with uh, Downs syndrome. Here's an example of a patient with congenital atresia of the external auditory canal. There's no external auditory canal whatsoever here. This is where the tympanic membrane ought to be. Uh, instead of discrete, well-formed ossicles, we just see a malleocutial blob and an ill-formed bit of bone where the stapes ought to be. There is no oval window. You can see this quasi-stapes pointed towards where the oval window ought to be. There's just nothing there. The overall size of the epitympanic cavity is small. This is going to be a difficult repair. Never forget the facial nerve when you're dealing with congenital atresia. Here's an example where the classic example of the facial nerve uh, tympanic segment displaced to the lateral aspect of the small middle ear cavity. The second genu is also often displaced anteriorly and inferiorly, blunting, that is, of the second genu. We look for that as well. External auditory canals should have a normal, mild upslope on either side. This is, this is within uh, the normal range for an external auditory canal. When you see an external auditory canal that is severely upsloped, usually that is a congenital abnormality such as trisomy 21, uh, which is the case in this patient. Well, that's the external auditory canal. Next up, the cerebellopontine angle cistern.